On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Maura is 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Maura's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at Direct at gmail.com, or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Maura Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I'm Tim here today with Lance in the Crawl Space Studios in Wormtown. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing very well today. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing pretty well, Lance. And for this episode, we talk about the mysterious disappearance of a fellow named Robert Wayne Cox. And we have on our friend Jennifer Amell, who helps us with some of these cases. And Lance, this case originally came in by way of private investigations for the missing. Yep, it's one of those cases that we are covering on the Missing Maura Murray feed. And like you said, Jennifer Amell has joined us once again. She puts together a lot of information uh, and in detailed bullet point style that we go over. And it's uh, very thorough or or, or as thorough as we can get to this point. She speaks with family members. And in the case of Robert Wayne Cox, she spoke with Robert's sister, Lydia. So a lot of that information comes from Lydia. And real quick, Robert Wayne Cox disappeared on February 19th, 2011 from Havana, Arkansas. He's 5'10", 150 pounds. He was wearing a navy blue hooded sweatshirt, gray sweatpants, and gray sneakers. He's a Caucasian male, graying brown hair, brown eyes. And if you have any information on his disappearance, please call the Danville Police Department at 479-495-4881 or the Yell County Sheriff's Office at 479-229-4175. And I want to give a shout out to Marissa from The Vanished, of course. Tim, you and I recently spoke and we said that you can't really cover a missing person investigation and not have it already been covered by Marissa from The Vanished. So just wanted to give her a shout out. Uh, She did cover Robert Wayne Cox and she did speak with his sister Lydia. So uh, uh, some of that information is also drawn from her episode. Yeah, that's right. And Fox 16 uh, from Little Rock does some, uh, some really good coverage as well. And Lance, for our weekly segment on this date, Angela K. Smith went missing. She was 30 years old, last seen on March 12th, 2016, after her trailer home on Little Creek Road in Manchester, Kentucky, caught fire and burnt down. Yes, the property was searched. There was no indication that anyone was home at the time of the fire, but there's no sign of Angela. Angela was 5'5", 130 to 145 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes. Anyone with information should contact the Kentucky State Police at 606-878-6622. And these on this date was brought to you by... Our cohorts, Michelle and Jillian from Private Investigations for the Missing, and you can get more information on all of these on this date at investigationsforthemissing.org, and you can check them out on Twitter at PI for the Missing. Okay, so thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy this episode on Robert Wayne Cox. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. Jen Amell, how are you today, Jen? I'm doing pretty good, enjoying this spring weather. 
Good. Well, we are here today, and thank you for joining us to discuss the mysterious disappearance of Robert Wayne Cox and uh, your work into his disappearance. So thank you for putting this together. And uh, what do you make of this one? Um, I think this is a very interesting case and one of those that has received little attention because it is an elder gentleman, and I, I feel like those cases that are not like white young women kind of go under the radar in terms of media. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you're accurate in your assessment of that. Uh, this man, uh, Mr. Wayne Cox, Robert Wayne Cox, uh, was 57 when he disappeared, and the circumstances are really uh, mysterious, as most uh, disappearances are, but uh, his are especially mysterious. Um, it's, it's yet another man who was uh, in a tiny, tiny town. Um, everyone knew everybody. Uh, how did this case come to your attention, Jen? Uh, we received a message from his sister, uh, Miss Lydia. She was just looking for more exposure for her brother's case. Um, I know it had been very hard on their father, Gene, so she was looking for some closure maybe before he passed away. And when you say that we received the information, uh, who are you speaking of? Uh, we received the information through the private investigations for the missing website. They sent us an email. Gotcha. Okay, so Robert disappeared on February 19th, 2011 from Havana, Arkansas. And Havana is a very small rural town in Yell County, Arkansas. And in 2017, it had a population of only 361 people and hasn't grown since. You can drive the length of this town in less than a mile. So very, very tiny. The land is heavily wooded and there's cow pastures and row crops. And this information that we're uh, referencing here, this is information that you, Jen, have put together uh, in one of your research papers. And we'll cite the sources as uh, appropriate. But... Um, you did a lot of work on this. Uh, it must have been tough to access some of this information, being that it's not a very uh, well-known case and being that Havana is this tiny rural town. Yeah, there's really not a whole lot of information out there on the Internet. Very little on Reddit. You know, people aren't really talking about this case, unfortunately. So I did actually have the opportunity to speak with Lydia at length on the phone, and most of this information comes directly from her. Yeah, I heard her on um, Marissa Jones's The Vanish podcast and uh, saw her on some news videos. She really comes off um, super authentic and just really inspiring, actually, how passionate she looks into her brother's case. Now, when would you say that uh, she started speaking out about her brother's case? It seems like immediately. Yeah. Yeah, because he only went missing in 2011. The last person who saw him alive was his wife, Vicky. Vicky Ann. So it's sort of turned into like a, a story of sides here. Vicky Ann is saying she saw Robert walk out sort of into, I guess, woods. They call it clear cut. It's, it's an ironic name. It, it kind of is. I, I attached some pictures to the document at the, at the bottom from, um, from these news videos. Uh, from Fox 16, and you can see the how, how thick it is. Actually, Lance, it reminds me of our uh, hike into the coordinates, actually off the trail into the coordinates. It's like it really hard to get into the actual brush of that. It doesn't really make much sense. And this was a man who had been disabled at this point, and he could barely walk. So that's And, and Vicky Ann was supposed to be taking care of him. So this story is very concerning to Lydia and... It really doesn't make much sense at all. Yeah, and did, were they uh, owners of this parcel of land? Because I know, Jen, based on your research, that the family owned a bunch of land in Yale County, right? Um, I'm not sure if it was like land that was separated throughout the county. I think it was like a couple acres um, in this small town of Havana, like right outside of town. Um, gotcha. But they had multiple like houses on this property. I know Robert actually helped in building his own house and uh, his father, Gene also built a home for himself on the land where he continues to live. That's, that's, that's super impressive. And what did Robert do for work? Robert um, actually ended up restoring antique trucks on his property, which sounds pretty cool. That sounds like a dream job. If you're able to do it, if you have the, uh, you know, the, the mental uh, fortitude to do that. It feels like it takes a lot of patience to do something like that. 
and it was mentioned earlier that he had some health problems. And Tim, you said that he could, uh, he had had trouble walking. Uh, what what were his health problems at the time, and how long had he been uh, sort of dealing with these health problems leading up to his disappearance? So there is some conflicting information out there on whether Robert had been previously diagnosed with dementia or not. And part of that is in this news clip that we're about to play here from KATV Little Rock, CBS 7, where they say Robert had been diagnosed with dementia. But Jen says that Robert's sister, Lydia, claims he was never officially diagnosed with dementia. Today marks one year since a Yale County man diagnosed with dementia vanished from outside his home. Tonight, his sister is speaking out, concerned that her brother is the victim of foul play. So this is the clear cut coming in from the opposite side. The way we're going in is the way that he would have supposedly had to walk up out of here. Lydia Carter's brother, 58-year-old Robert Cox, disappeared from outside his home in Havana, Arkansas last February. It was a Saturday afternoon. Having been diagnosed with dementia a year earlier, she called to check on him and says his wife of 20 years said he was outside by himself. She told me that she's seen him, he was almost to the road, and that she was going to get her car and go up on the road and pick him up. Well, in less than five minutes that it took her to get her car and go up on the road and pick him up, he disappeared out of sight in the clear cut. Carter says more than 100 people turned out that weekend to search for her brother. Search and rescue crews used tracking dogs, a state police helicopter searched from the sky, even dive teams were brought in to scour a pond and wells. But there was no sign of him. Carter is convinced there is no way he could have made it through the rugged terrain that had recently been clear cut because of his physical and mental capabilities. This home video shows how he walked with his head down. Walked with a shuffled gait, had to have help in and out of the vehicles, um, sometimes even had to have help, you know, around the house, wasn't able to dress himself. He was a two-year-old in an adult's body. Carter says investigators placed this marker where his wife says she last saw her husband. In my opinion, if he would have been here, he would have still been here because he would have, he would have fallen. And once he fell, he ain't gonna, he's not going to get up because he's not able to get up on his own. Cox's wife drove up while we were filming, but refused to make any comments about her husband's disappearance on or off camera. She says she is just too emotional to talk about it right now. As for Carter, she will continue to search for answers, wondering if her brother is still alive, has died, or could have been murdered. It's a daily nightmare. It's just something that you never, you never get a break from it. You grieve every day. And state police activated a silver alert after Cox disappeared last year. The Yale County Sheriff's Department says because the investigation is ongoing, they cannot comment. If you have a tip that could help find Cox, call the Yale County Sheriff's Department. Well, in the autumn of 2010, Robert began to develop uh, these problems, and it started as just anxiety and sort of an inability to sit still. And he would get into his truck and drive around aimlessly. But then he started to develop a hunch and was unable to lift his head uh, up straight. He was kind of unable to lift his chin from his chest, and he was walking in a slow and shuffling manner. And uh, so some people thought maybe something like MS or, or dementia or something like that was happening to Robert, but it was all happening very quickly. And by November, Robert was uh, unable to lift his head or speak. And he required around-the-clock care, expensive hospital equipment, and multiple visits from nurses throughout the week. And uh, so you know what that means about hospital bills, you know, medical bills. And uh, it became daunting for this, uh, this family. So this was in the autumn of 2010 that he first began to develop the symptoms. So that would make him only 56. Am I right that he was only 56 when he just when he started suddenly developing these symptoms? Yeah, 56 or 57, I would say. Again, it all happened really quickly. And he was due to be tested for dementia in February, but he disappeared before any formal diagnosis was reached. I have two questions. Who who? scheduled him to be tested for dementia and was he experiencing uh, mental signs of dementia or or was it just the physical um, I guess like the anxiety and driving around aimlessly 
probably just to like calm himself of the anxiety but i don't know if that's necessarily dementia i'm not an expert on that but yeah w- w- was there anything that he was saying that was you know reported to be not right or or a little off you know i'm definitely not an expert on this kind of thing either but uh some people online i had noticed people talking about uh lou gehrig's disease as a possibility um but as far as anything else mental i hadn't seen anything else other than the driving around aimlessly did uh did lydia mention anything else to you jen so lydia mentioned that this was a rumor that started circulating after robert's disappearance that he may have had dementia um i think this might have come from his uh, former wife vicky ann uh but like we said before there's no formal diagnosis and lydia didn't mention any kind of like slurs in speech um that preceded his inability to speak to speak um but i guess it's hard to tell if there was any mental deterioration if you can't speak fair points yeah yeah exactly so on the afternoon of february 19th 2011 robert went out to the clear cut near their house and vicky planned to drive her car down to the clear cut and pick him up at about 1 p.m But in about five minutes or so, she claimed to have turned away. She says Robert disappeared. So just starting with the story, I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. This is a guy who was supposedly not really able to walk very well. So what was she doing letting him out? I don't understand what happened here. Yeah, it seems like an unlikely story. Nothing about it really makes sense. If Vicky did claim to be like going to pick him up in a car... How would he have gotten there? Did she drive him to the clear cut and for what purpose? Right. And then she drove back home for five minutes and then came back. I'm really, I'm really unsure of, of any of this. It sounds really suspicious. I just want to back up real quick. Vicky Ann, you said, was his wife at the time. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So they were, was she ever his, is she now his ex-wife? Is that like official? He has been declared dead, yeah. So uh, so they are exes, and Vicky Ann actually is now remarried. Oh, okay. I guess that was, yeah, that's sort of my question, was uh, how has she moved on since his disappearance? She got married about a year later to a guy named George Logan Keith. Now, had she been married previously before Robert's uh, marriage? I'm not sure if there was a marriage previously, but she does have children from a previous relationship that uh, Robert helped raise oh okay and was there any uh indication as to where the father of those children currently resides or was at the time you know what i didn't ask lydia about that but it's a good question so lydia's uh sort of commented that robert was less of a stepfather and more of like a guy who stepped in as a father so that sort of points to me like the other father was out of the picture right okay and what was the financial status of Robert and uh, and Vicky Ann at the time? I mean, I know that they Robert's family owned property, but that doesn't necessarily translate to um, you know instant wealth or obvious wealth. Yeah, I don't I don't think that they were rolling in the cash, you know, being out in this very rural area. Plus, I imagine that the medical bills were piling up due to Robert's quick decline. So Vicky Ann reports him missing, and she reports it to the Yell County Sheriff's Department, and then she tells Robert's family, correct? Yes. And then they did they immediately go on a, uh, on a search of the, the woods and, and the neighborhood and, and the surrounding areas? Um, you know what? I'm not sure exactly of like the linear timeline of when each person knew about Robert's disappearance. It's very likely that Vicky actually called maybe Jean since he did live on the property and he would have assisted in a, in a search. I think a day went by until they reported it to the sheriff's office, who then organized a ground search. And I believe Lydia, who is uh, Robert's sister, got a phone call from Vicky Ann saying Robert's missing, and, and then she hung up. Was that the wording in that? Yeah, yeah, just about. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty disappointing. Yeah, it's got to be a harrowing phone call to get, especially knowing her brother's state. You know, you worry for a person who's not too mobile out in the wilderness. How is there any way he's alone? 
you know, uh, or unaccounted for. I just don't, I, I, d- I do not understand. Oh, you mean like right before he disappears? Like how, how is no one watching him to make sure that he's okay? I can see wh- why he'd be alone in a room for moments. Maybe someone's cooking a meal for him or doing something else, or maybe you're at work or something. But, uh, you know, out, out alone outside i and and maybe maybe you know that this, this was something robert wanted maybe he wanted to go out there um you know i i do know we have heard of stories where people with diseases um you know will take their own lives but because they don't want us they don't want their family to have to take care of them um in in really upsetting ways but it doesn't sound like he could have gone anywhere and it really also doesn't sound like he was picked up by someone random. That that makes less sense. And on the uh, suicide angle, I've never been in that situation where a family member has been uh, in a position like that. But we do hear a lot that these uh, people with conditions like this will take into account the insurance money. I don't know if he were to commit suicide, how that would benefit anyone in his family. If if because a lot of insurance policies have like a suicide clause, like if he's officially declared a suicide, that could cancel out life insurance policies. So that could be something that he takes into account. Also, was he capable of driving? It doesn't sound like he was capable of driving. No, I, I, he wasn't capable of walking or talking, apparently, at that point. So I would have to say no. And um, Vicky Ann had him declared deceased so quickly, about a year and a half after he went missing, right uh, right around the time she married her, um, her husband, George Keith. Were they still searching for him at the time, or had the search ended? How long did the search go on for, that, do we know? Vicky Ann and her son, they didn't search at all. Other than reporting him missing, but they weren't out, like, in the, in the trenches. No, I don't even think they were they were co- cooperative. Um, I, b- I believe there was a a law enforcement search at, at some point early on, but it was called off pretty quickly. Is isn't that uh, right, Jen? Is that what Lydia told you? I mean, I'm not sure it's completely fair to to say that the sheriff's department didn't do a comprehensive search in the beginning. I do know that Lydia and her husband went out and uh, looked in some wells that. Mm-hmm that Robert could have fallen down in in the forest. And then there was another rumor that started that uh, Robert's body had been dumped in a nearby lake. So the sheriff's office uh, deployed some divers and they actually used some sonar to try to see if a body was in there, but nothing was recovered. Now, Robert was about 155 pounds, according to the information that we have here. And he was 5'10", so that I feel like that's like a very average size for, for a, um, a male his age. How does someone go missing permanently like this seems? Would it, did one person do this? I, because I, I feel like we're, we're looking at Vicki Ann's story, and is she capable of hauling a body or dragging a body 155 pounds of, of weight through this, uh, through this terrain? What's her story? What's her backstory? Was she gone for a period of time? Does she have access to power tools, a, a garage? Um, I would venture to say that she absolutely could not have accomplished this by herself. Um, I've seen some footage of her, some pictures of her, and she doesn't seem to be of the build to have gotten rid of Robert's body by herself. Um, there is some rumors to the effect that her son helped. Yeah, I believe her son um, didn't help much in the search and, and sort of was acting suspiciously afterwards, um, which, to, you know, to which means I, I don't really know, wh- you know, what that means. Um, but it would seem like, you know, th- there's still the question of, you know, where is he, right? So we can point the finger at Vicky Ann and say, you know more, that story about seeing him last doesn't make any sense, but it still doesn't tell us where he is, you know, or, or how he was, how he got somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, and there doesn't seem to be much effort on the police's side to question Vicky Ann. I know there was some suspicion with the police department that they were maybe protecting Vicky Ann and her son. I think her son has some tie to law enforcement, or he was like a firefighter, I think, uh... Lydia said, but sometimes the law enforcement community can be pretty tight knit and will just 
call off any kind of investigation if nobody's asking questions other than, you know, the one family member left that's still interested in finding answers. My counter to that is this is a town of 361 people. And I mean, I get that there's like a a brotherhood amongst uh, law enforcement, firefighters and, and the sort. But what's the motivating factor for law enforcement to turn a blind eye to something like this when they know that 360 people in the town sort of have an idea of what happened and they know now is it just simply like small town rule like we we own this town and and you know if you're in with us you can pretty much get away with anything it could be like that and uh, i think i heard it on the vanish podcast from lydia but uh I believe his car was sold by Vicky Ann uh, right away, or, the, or that car. Um, so that is kind of suspicious too. And uh, and the hospital equipment that he was he was using, uh, needing, um, was also returned very quickly. Is that accurate, Jen? Yeah, it is. Which like, if you were holding out hope that your husband might be found in the next day or so or even weak, like, wouldn't you hold on to that stuff in hopes that he would, you know, be safe and come home? Well, to, to play, uh, yeah, you would, but to play devil's advocate, um, I guess we're not entirely sure how long she was holding on to the medical equipment. And again, just playing devil's advocate, it could be something where she had seen her husband deteriorating and maybe naturally went to, well, you know, there's no way he's surviving out there in his condition. And maybe she just wanted to get rid of the the medical equipment so she didn't have to look at it every day and be reminded of, of something that was painful. Yeah, I could see it being a cost-effective move as well. No, I, I mean, maybe cost-effective, but I was speaking more just emotionally. I'm just being, you know, again, the devil's advocate here. And, and uh, you know, who knows what kind of toll that took on, on her watching her husband deteriorate like that. What about burning his clothes? Is that something that... Uh... That's a fact. Yeah, I believe um I believe she and her Vicky Ann and her son uh burnt his clothes um shortly after his disappearance or some of his clothes. Not really sure what that was about. Where where was that coming from? Just out of curiosity. Was that the Vanish? I believe I heard that from Lydia on the Vanish podcast. Yeah, I, I heard that too. Well, I mean, burning his clothes is is one thing you could probably just uh give those to, you know, Goodwill or Salvation Army. Uh you know, I'm not saying that these uh, actions are not suspicious at all. Oh, no, 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 no. It sounds like you're completely on Vicky Ann's side. <laughs> I am side. team Vicky Ann. <laughs> so tell us why uh, why he went missing before any any appointment to find out, uh, to, to diagnose this poor man. He uh, th- These medical issues, I saw someone here on, uh, on another uh, website mentioning Parkinson's, um, anxiety, anxiety, Dementia, restlessness, drooping head, shuffling, they are all symptoms of Parkinson's perhaps as well. But some people think he was poisoned, and that's why he never made it to the hospital for a a proper diagnosis, because they would have known. Yeah, and I actually have a a very interesting fact uh, on the poisoning angle. Um, So in my conversation with Lydia, she actually mentioned that a family member of of, uh, Vicky Ann's actually went to prison for poisoning her husband. Okay, I'm 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 uh slowly stepping away from team Vicky's side here. <laughs> uh okay, so Vicky Ann had a family member that went to prison for attempted murder by way of poison. Correct. Yeah. Did she ever visit this person? Was this person in prison at the time or had they been released? And what is the relation to this person? My big question is, could this be something that she had reached out to this person, whether they were in prison or maybe this person either gave her the information on how to do this or maybe they were out of prison and and they uh, participated in this? Yeah, it's definitely an angle that Lydia was looking into. Um, She didn't recover any evidence that Vicky Ann had approached this person um, or that this person had any involvement in uh, Vicky Ann and Robert's situation but it's definitely possible okay i see two scenarios if we're going down the poison route one is that the illness was because of the poison the the poison started the illness and the second one is that he might have definitely had parkinson's or ms or an affliction like that and the poison was administered to 
accelerate the deterioration. Yeah, that's definitely two options. In any homicide situation, you have to look to like who is going to gain the most. And if it was the former, if Vicky Ann actually wanted to kill her husband, she would have a life insurance policy to collect on. Um, But it doesn't really explain why she would go to the length of getting all the hospital equipment and incurring the medical bills. Right. And he's not yet found. So if the poison was administered to accelerate the deterioration, I would imagine that her end game in her in her head is that he dies at home and she can say the illness got the better of him. But in fact, he's not even around. So it almost works against her. Yeah, I mean, it certainly lends a little more validation to the poisoning theory, you know, that his body isn't around because it could have been, you know, once he died, it could have been tested for uh, poisoning. So, yeah, I think what you're saying is, you know, if she was going to kill him a different way, it could have been at home. Maybe that would have been a little less suspicious. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to uh, wrap my head around the entirety of a poison theory. If she deliberately starts administering this poison to him, whether or not it was after he got uh, these symptoms or if the poison uh, was the contributing factor to the symptoms, I wonder if she even had an end game at all. Maybe like halfway through, she realized he was deteriorating so much and it could have occurred to her, oh, man, if if he dies in the house, they're probably going to do a test and they're going to find poison. So maybe I need to get him out of here. Uh, you know, up the uh, the administration of the poison and and dump him somewhere. Not to sound like super crass about the whole thing, but it it feels like, you know, she almost started playing a long game to make it look like one thing, if it was her. I'm, all, I'm speaking super hypothetically. Sure. If she was playing like this long game so that he deteriorated and once he died, everyone expected it, but then maybe he deteriorated too fast because of the poison administration and and she realized well they're definitely going to look into this because who who dies within like a few months it's you know people do but only after it's determined based on a medical examination what it was so maybe she did see like this is going too fast and 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 the alternative explanation could be he wandered off in the woods because he was depressed and and anxious Right. So, yeah, I wonder what that motive for the inciting incident, um, if she did, in fact, start poisoning him, would have been. Uh, She did get married about a year and a half after he went missing. So you have to wonder now, looking back, uh, if if uh, there was something going on before. I mean, maybe that was the inciting incident. And then she started poisoning him, obviously, hypothetically. I know it does seem like this is uh, coming at her, but something happened to him in a rapid pace. And f- from from everything that we've looked at, all the research that you've done, Jen, and, and speaking with, with Lydia and even Lydia's appearance on, on The Vanished, and there has to be some explanation. And it's unfortunate that that explanation was maybe days away. You know, they were probably prepping him to get a, an actual diagnosis. And, you know, just looking at these pictures of him, you can see, like, he's... The, the pictures of him when he's well compared to when he's not well, it looks it, it it's not like it's not like his hair is totally gray and you can look at the picture of him well and say, oh, well, you know, five. It looks like that was five years ago. It it looks like the next day. Yeah, it, it really does. And and he's a pretty young guy, you know, for for a, a condition to deteriorate like that, like so quickly. And uh, on that topic, I actually uh, wanted to read a, a message board post here from someone named JoLynn Carter, who uh, says that her son um, used to employ Rob. And uh, she said that uh, she visited Rob uh, with her son during that time as his uh, physical um, impairments progressed. And she says that he could never, ever have walked away. And he definitely couldn't have walked through that clear cut. Even able-bodied men had trouble uh, getting through that clear cut, uh, searching for down trees and things like that. And Jen, there's some video of Robert walking on the news. Uh, What does that look like? Yeah, so there's what looks to be like a home video of maybe a family member's child who's blurred out. Robert's walking in the background in this very slow, shuffling way, and his chin is 
like we mentioned before, all the way down to his chest. Definitely doesn't look like a person who would disappear or be able to even get away of his own volition. Is there any report that Robert maybe sent up uh, warning flags to his family, maybe uh, suggesting or indicating or trying to communicate with them that this uh, deterioration, this neurological or nerve condition wasn't uh, natural, that maybe there was something going on that was causing this? Um, Lydia didn't mention anything that Robert would have said before he lost his ability to speak. Um, I'm not sure if anybody really suspected that it was anything other than a natural decline, unfortunately. Another scenario could be that Robert was just like a private person. I know there's like uh, sometimes, especially men, have a little bit of a complex if they become ill and aren't able to care for themselves. Like there's a little bit of pride in saying like, hey, something's wrong. So maybe it just happened so fast and he didn't tell anybody. And when it became time that he, you know, he thought something was wrong, he wasn't able to tell anybody. Did it, him and Vicky Ann have a good marriage? I don't know. I can't speak to that. Well, uh, looking here at some of these dated photos, it seems like this, you know, whatever his condition was, progressed really quickly. So looking at some of these photos, there's one where it's uh, like a, almost like a glamour shot with Robert and Vicky Ann in September of 2010. And there Robert sitting up, almost straight up completely, it seems like. But then a picture from two months later in November of 2010 has him uh, his has his chin basically tucked to his to his chest. And then just three months later in February of 2011 has him really completely hunched over um, so much worse. And if you look at the one in September and then the photo in February, again, that's like five months, maybe six months um, that that is such a quick progression of whatever was afflicting him. It's a really stark difference looking at them lined up like this. And even from September to November, he looks to have lost like 50 pounds. Yeah. Now I'm trying to find some information on how quickly uh, Parkinson's or how quickly a- any of these d- diseases that we've discussed um, can progress. And uh, I'm not finding anything that, that says it progresses that quickly, but I am not a medical professional. Well, I think that this guy who worked on his property and, and with his family to build homes would probably want to know what's happening with his body. And before losing the ability to speak, I personally think that someone like this would want to know as soon as possible. I, I get the pride thing, but... This is someone who worked with their hands and and like built a home, you know. Like, I, and if he if he feels that he's deteriorating that fast, this should have been bring me to the hospital, like bring me to the hospital, and 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 let's get the testing started. And and I know it seems like it, it's moved pretty fast, but man, how do you how do you wait? Even as a family, even as his wife, how do you wait until he can't even lift his head up? Yeah, I wonder. Does uh, did Lydia have anything to say about that? Um, Jen was was Lydia. Um, I I know she had claimed that that she would uh, take care of of Robert with Vicky Ann, and she would be there to help every step of the way. It's not like they didn't try to get help at all from or diagnosis. Like they did take Robert to the doctor and uh, set him up with some equipment he might have needed. Um, They had nurses come, and Lydia definitely did share in the care whenever she could. I mean, she was a working person, so I imagine she couldn't be there all the time. But maybe, like, these things do take time. Diagnoses take time, um, and he was scheduled for one. So I don't want to shade in this story like the family didn't care, and they didn't take him for help. Thank you. Yeah, cool. That's exactly what I was hoping for, is because... It does. We keep reiterating and, and emphasizing how quickly it went, but there had to have been some time there. I can't imagine that these that that these people wouldn't almost immediately want something to be done. And you mentioned the medical equipment. You know that had been those those uh, measures had been taken to to get a me, uh, medical equipment to uh, you know care for him while he was at home. So it was a process to uh, to to figure out what was wrong with him. 
Yeah, so it wasn't like Vicky Ann was keeping him from seeing a doctor at all. Yeah. That that didn't happen. Yeah, right. Like she didn't lock him in the house, and I'm sure there was like some pressure from Lydia and Gene, his father, to figure out what was going on as well because they loved and cared for Robert. Yeah, were they religious? I don't know. Because I was, uh, I was just looking at your theories, and and there's another you wrote here, another angle about it not being perhaps a cold blooded, calculated murder. That it was more of a mercy, an act of mercy. Yeah, I mean that definitely could have been the case. If I were Robert and I was cognizant of this decision, maybe you would find some way to get the message across to the rest of your family that, you know, they shouldn't investigate this as a murder. But, I mean, it could have been just a decision made by Lydia and her son to, I guess, do the angel of death thing. Like, maybe they knew Robert wouldn't want to live like this. And it was, like you said, Lance, a, a mercy killing. I can definitely respect uh, the thought that you don't want to live um, a certain way, you know. But uh, again, I just I just come back to how quickly this all happened. Um, making decisions like that uh, over over the course of a few months seems seems a bit drastic. Um, there's a quote here from Gene from Robert's uh, father that was uh, particularly heartbreaking. He says, uh, I get up at night and I go out and look. He comes to me in my dreams, says Gene. Yeah, that's that particularly touched me. I mean, this is a man who's been seeking answers for years. And uh, I know from Lydia that he's not doing particularly well. He's been in hospice lately. So they're really looking for closure for Gene, if nothing else. And Jen, what about the property? What happened with that after uh, after Robert went missing? So Lydia and Jean actually ended up suing Vicky for ownership of the entire property because Vicky, I believe, was not living on the property anymore, but she still had, you know, full ownership of the property. And if you remember, Jean lived on a house in this property. So they went through like multiple appeals in different circuits of court. Um, but the court ended up ruling against Jean and Lydia in favor of Vicky. So she kept ownership of the property, although the court allowed Jean to live on this property until uh, the end of his life. What circumstances would the courts have to uh, award the property or um, allow the, the wife and not the immediate family to retain ownership? The property was under the name of Robert Cox. Uh, not under his father, Gene. So his next of kin would be his wife. So it defaulted to her once they um, had him declared deceased. Correct, yeah. And like the court, because there's no official um, inquisition or suspicion on Vicky Ann, um, the court had no choice but to let Vicky keep it because that's the law. And was there any accountability uh, as to the whereabouts of Vicky Ann's son during the uh, the days surrounding Robert's disappearance? I'm not sure where he was, but he didn't uh, participate in the search. And uh, I mean, he's still close with his mother, but that whole side of the family has completely cut ties from Lydia and the Cox side of the family. I think there was a family reunion a few months after Robert's disappearance and Neither Vicky nor her son uh, appeared at this reunion. Okay, Jen, I guess we're getting to that time in the episode where we hear your theory from the hatch. What uh, what are you thinking about this one? Yeah, theory from the hatch. So I think the only surety we have in this case is that Vicky Ann's story doesn't make any sense. So that means that she has something to hide. So having heard all of the you know, hearsay and evidence, it seems like Vicky had something to do with Robert's disappearance. Again, I, I, I want to reiterate that she had everything to gain by Robert's death. Um, she had the property to gain and she had a quite substantial life insurance policy. And if Robert was in fact sick through natural means, they had all this uh, hospital and medical bills building up over the course of, you know, this five or six months. So, I mean, it could have been an issue like where Vicky Ann panicked and she's like, how am I going to pay for this? This is 
going to ruin my whole life and he's probably going to die anyway. So might as well expedite the process. Right. You can almost see it logically there if that's what happened. Um, but, uh, it does seem, seem a bit darker than that, um, to me. And, uh, it, it does it does seem really suspicious with um with his condition progressing like that and uh and the and, and the idea of, of poisoning being um put out there and she made him some some uh chocolate shakes some speculation online that antifreeze could have uh been what happened you know she could have poured a little bit of that in there cuz it's sweet Put it, put it in a shake, and it slowly disables the person. So I don't know how accurate that is. Obviously, don't try that at home. But uh, it sounds like uh, sounds like bad news. Sounds like Vicky Ann's bad news. Was there any uh, rumors out there or any speculation about his body being uh, driven to Ozark National Forest? No, but it's definitely a possibility. There was a rumor that um, Robert would have been picked up from the clearing and taken somewhere. Well, it's a it's a tiny area like geographically it's very seems very uh very flat I guess for the most part. I mean, I I hate to speculate like where to dump a body, but if if these if these individuals if we're, you know, leaning towards Vicky Ann being suspicious and her son, it's not easy to make a body disappear. Just, you know, your first your first murder and you have to make this body disappear no one panics and the body's never found is impressive, but not in a good way to me. No, definitely not. But I would counter that in saying like, this is a super rural area. I mean, you've got a national forest to the South. You've got the Ozark mountains to the North. This is vast, vast wilderness we're talking about. So like how extensive was the search? It might've been, you know, five square miles. You go beyond that and it's gone. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, maybe uh, maybe the search was only in that contained area of Havana, or maybe a little bit beyond. So, I think you said you could you could drive the length of Havana was less than a mile. So even if you extend that five times, you're still only at like a five mile radius, six miles, seven miles, maybe. Just having property out in the like a very rural area. Like you have every opportunity to like do what you want and not be afraid that you'd be disturbed. 